Hello and welcome again. I'm so glad and thankful that you have decided to join me on today, Breaking Bread with Bishop. And uh, these are very trying times, but yet these are exciting times uh, for us in ministry because God is up to something. You're not gonna believe this, but I finally have in my hands uh, my new book, uh, who Stole Sunday Morning? I want you to do me a favor and I want you to go and get your, your copy and be one of the first ones to get a copy of this book. And um, you can log on to SirWalterMack.com and uh, scroll down to where you see uh, where it says Shop All Books and uh, you can get your copy of this book. I'm going to be doing teaching uh, in this book so you want to go ahead and get your copy so that you can join us in that teaching at some point in time uh, but tonight or today whenever you're watching this uh, I'm going to be talking about controversial matters and um, just addressing some questions that uh, many of you have sent to me uh, via text and email about just some of my thoughts on some things that's happening and I just want to kind of do these kind of sessions from time to time just so that you'll know what's going on in, in my mind and in my spirit about some of these things that's happening. And so let's just get started. And uh, I'll just kind of give you some, some uh, pieces that's, that's relevant and uh, in terms of what's happening today. Uh, the first one, uh, get your Bibles because we are going to do Bible study and uh, share this message and text someone and let them know that Breaking Bread with Bishop is on right now, all right? Uh, the first one is this, uh, let me see here. What has been your biggest revelation uh, for year 2020? That's a great question. What has been your biggest revelation for year 2020? It's interesting because uh, in the first of the year, uh, everybody was praying for vision. Uh, we started out the year asking God to reveal to us and give us 2020 vision. Um, not knowing that actually 2015 vision is clearer than 2020 vision. But we wanted to see something um, that was very clear for us to see. All right, so we asked God for 2020 vision. And, um, and we didn't know that God was going to make some things crystal clear for us in the way that he did. First thing he did, that he permitted a virus to clarify some things for us culturally. Um, this virus has come and uh, it has clarified a whole lot of things for us. Um, that it has made clear for us, for many of us, that we were codependent upon the church building and not God himself. That I have discovered that more people have strengthened their relationship with God and it had nothing to do with the building. Praise God for that. Um, our relationship with God has been made clearer. Our, our relationship with each other, families have been strengthened and, and relationships have been strengthened. and. And God set it up so that you could not depend on the superficial things to strengthen your relationship with him, but that you had to, to make effort to see him in a different way. And so, um, so then our relationships were made clearer this year. But then, now watch this. We were praying for 2020 vision, not knowing that God was going to capture the, the predominant sin of America on video film out of all the methods that sin could have been revealed. God revealed uh, the predominant sin of America, which is racism on video that we may see it with our eyes. We prayed for vision, 2020 vision, and God showed it to us. He showed it to us right there on video film. And so um, that, that was probably one of my 
um, biggest revelations for this year is, is to see what God is doing. And, and so then I think that we should still be praying for what God is doing in the midst of all of this. And, and that's why I say it's an exciting time because, um, because I truly believe and I live by this one scripture and I taught it, as a matter of fact, last week, if you go back and get the teaching, that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So what I mean by that is simply this, Romans 8, 28, that I believe that in the midst of everything that's happening, God is working something good out of this and good is going to come out of this. But you have to have the spiritual aptitude and the spiritual attitude to be able to see the good that's coming through this. All right. So thank you for asking that question. And uh, that is, is one of the biggest revelations that I've seen this year. Here, here's, here's the second question that I have. Uh, is protesting biblical and why is it important? Excellent question. Excellent question. So is protesting biblical and why is that important? Well, uh, indeed, protesting is biblical and uh, it is very important. And uh, so then um, I want you to see some of those pictures that we're showing you right now uh, with protesting and uh, we're protesting all over the world. Uh, protesting is biblical in Exodus 9 uh, verses 1 through 7. You're going to read that um, when when Israel is in bondage under King Pharaoh, um, God actually uh, positions Moses and tell Moses to go before Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And when, when Moses goes and stands before Pharaoh, of course, you know, God calls Moses to to go and stands before 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 Pharaoh, and um, but but he's calling him to 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 start a revolution, and the revolution is for Moses to lead the children of Israel out of bondage to a land of of freedom and a land flowing of milk and honey. All right, so what I'm telling you is that God indeed positions Moses to start a protest, all right? That's in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, um, in Matthew 21, verse 12, um, Jesus goes into the temple and he finds out that the temple keepers have taken the temple and turned it into a place where they are earning money for their personal good, uh, for their personal benefit. And, um, and he, the Bible says that Jesus then takes the um, tables and he turns them over. And, and he, he, um, he, he's in bitter, uh, he's in anger. He, he turns the tables over in, in frustration and out of anger. He turns the tables over. And he stages a protest against what they're doing. Protesting is biblical from those perspectives. And I want to say to you that, um, that these young people that are marching the street, this is a good thing. And um, all the way back to the days of the civil rights movement, um, the civil rights movement was always... Um, led by young people. Um, one, Dr. King had a philosophy of engaging young people uh, for, for many reasons because he understood that if change was going to happen, it was going to change with them. But then also he understood that they would mellow the heart of America. Um, and so then now young people are marching all over um, the land, all over the globe. One, because they don't want their future to reflect what they have seen in the past. Um, I want you to know that when you look at what's happening now um, in the life of George Floyd and so many others, um, um, to my, our sister, because of the death of our sister Brianna and so many others, both men and women, 
And by no means did I mean to leave our sisters out last week, but because our sisters are being killed by the police as well. Um, but that I just want to say that the reason that young people are, are marching, and I, I actually have a chapter in this book on why young people are marching and, and um, why young white people are marching, young white children are marching, and why young uh, blacks are marching. And in this book, I talk about it, that young whites are marching because they are disgruntled with the hypocrisy that they see in their white churches. And this is out of research. Um, they, they have yet to draw a connection between how in the world did 80% of the evangelical church support an administration that is so brutal and so harmful to people and to nations that their church support, that their church supports. So for an example, um, they have a hard time drawing a connection between um, their churches sending food and clothes to third world countries. And then they support a president that called those same countries as whole nations. Are you feeling me? Um, they have a hard time understanding um, that they have a church that, that you know, that, they, that, that supports a president that, that says harsh things and brutal things about women and about people and about disabled people and, and, and just and call, you know, white supremacists good people. So white children are marching out of hypocrisy and they're frustrated with it. Um, just the other day, we literally saw uh, just some bad cops. Not all cops are bad. Let me, let me make that very clear. But we literally saw some cops push a 75-year-old man down. And the response is, well, they really didn't push him. That's why they're marching. Because you can't tell them what they didn't see. And so they're marching for that reason. Black youth are marching, and I talk about that in this book. Black youth are marching, uh, not so much because of hypocrisy, but because of apathy. They're tired of going to churches where we are so busy, caught up praying, and we're not talking about social conditions that's happening right in our communities or doing anything about them. They know we care about the homeless. They know we care about the brother in prison. They know we care about um, social conditions and, and issues that's, that's pertaining to us, but they don't see us doing anything about it. They don't see us hitting the streets and, and waging war against those things that are happening in our communities. So they are tired. They are not, they are saying, listen, we're tired of praying. We're ready for some action. So the Black Lives Matter movement is the first social justice movement that started outside of the church. Isn't that interesting? That the church used to be the headlights and now we're the taillights. <laughs> and so young people are saying, hey, we're not singing we shall overcome anymore. We're singing we shall come over. And they are making changes. Listen to these changes that, that in 10 days have been made. Listen to these changes. Minneapolis has banned chokeholds for their police. Charges have been upgraded for the officers involved, uh, particularly uh, Chauvin. Uh, Dallas has adopted the duty to intervene, requiring officers to intervene if they see uh, an officer in that kind of position again. New Jersey Attorney General um, uh, has updated the use of force guidelines in Maryland. Um, they have, have also worked on their guidelines in Los Angeles. The City Council introduced a motion to reduce LAPD's $1.8 billion operating budget. Uh, police brutality captured on cameras uh, lead to immediate suspension and firing of officers in Buffalo and Fort Lauderdale. Um, uh, the street at the White House was named Black Lives Matter Plaza. Y'all saw that. All right. People all over the world in 
France and Amsterdam, Germany, uh, in Ireland, protesters in Spain, Athens, Greece, in Denmark. Things are happening all over the world. And the point is, these young people are making things happen. And all of this has happened in, in really 12 days. And the church has not had anything to do with it. So what I'm telling you is, is that protesting has a good, good context to it. And I'm not going to say to you that burning down buildings and, and um, destroying property, other people's property, is a good thing, though that has a reason behind it. And I know, since you're there, you want to talk about that. You want to talk about the role of looting and the role of burning down buildings. I would never say that that's right to do. Get me right. I would never say that that's right to do. But let me tell you what that's about, okay? Many of the buildings that are being burned down in these inner cities uh, are buildings that are, that are standing where many of these people used to live. So when you talk about gentrification, you're talking about, um, you're talking about an operation of economic development that has come in and pushed these people out of their communities. And in many places, these, some of these people are still in the community, but they see economic development on one side of the street, and it looks like, it looks like a bomb has hit the other side of the street. So when they burn down these building, what buildings, what they're burning down is a, an ideology or a system that says you are investing here, but not investing in us. Now, I'm not saying that that's right to burn down a building. I am saying that sometimes we are so stuck on what is happening and we don't address why it is happening, why the gap is there, all right? And when we get to the why, the why is much deeper than the what, all right? So then these things are happening all around us. And, and, um, and so the Bible and God was always clear about justice always clear about justice and the concern for the poor. Um, that's why James Cone wrote his book, God of the Oppressed. And in that book, he talks about in the Old Testament, God was always on the side of the oppressed. God was always moving on the side of the oppressed. And that's why God was always raising up Israel, because Israel was the oppressed people by those heavy-handed kings. And so God was always delivering Israel and bringing them to a place of deliverance. And so uh, that's the piece there. That was a great question. Um, and so thank you for submitting that question. And um, so what we must do is the marching is good, but I'm more concerned about after the march. So um, first, we must vote. Um, and don't wait until November the 3rd to vote. But we must start early voting. All right. And then two, um, we must begin to to strategize. I'm going to ask that for those of you who are um, who are aggressive and you want to see some positive things happen. Um, I put a post on Facebook and I was talking about how when I played football in grade school and um, my dad, he passed when I was 15. But um, when I played football, he was able to see some of my football games, and my mother was able to support me um, through high school and college. But one of the things that made me play harder was when I looked up in the stands and I saw them cheering me on. And what I'm telling you is that the world is cheering us. The world is cheering for us. They're cheering for us. And we can't, we can't go back. To some things that um, that that we have done to not to not represent ourselves the way we should have. Okay, so we got to change. We we got to make some changes too. We got to play harder. That's what play, made me play harder when I saw my mom and dad cheering me on. So when you see the world cheering you on, you got to play harder. So so then churches have to play harder. We got to move beyond racial gender and sexual barriers in our churches. We got to realize 
that God has a place for all of us in the kingdom of God. All right. Businesses must play harder. Um, we got to we got to, you know, rise up and and work on our marketing and our websites, because when when resources begin to come down the pipe for you after this virus moves forward and after things get back to normalcy, people are going to come to help you because you are a minority business or you because, you know, they understand that black lives matter now and you're a black business. Hey, they're going to be coming for you. But you got to upgrade your website. You know, you can't be running a bubblegum club. You got to look like you're a professional. You got to get some business cards. You got you, you to get your insurance together. You have to have your program. You got to do some staff training so that when these opportunities come, you can walk in the door. Are you hearing me? All right. Parents, um, listen, when resources come for you now, um, the educational opportunities, hey, at least get your child up so they can go to school. All right. We everybody has to play harder now. Everybody has to up, upgrade the game. Young people, listen, you got to get your education because you are not competing with just your friend next door. You're competing with the globe. The globe is marching for you. So everybody has to play harder. Black men, you have to play harder. No excuses for your success. Opportunities are getting ready to come your way. You got to prepare to go back to school, work, work on your trade, get your head right. Go ahead and get some counseling, deal with your addiction and go ahead and go to therapy and and be what God is calling you to be. Brother, pull up your pants. Look like you're going somewhere. Opportunities are coming your way. George Floyd died in front of us. The world is marching on your behalf and you have to get yourself together because opportunities are coming your way. And also for you, sister, also for you, sister, let me share something with you, sister. Go ahead and get yourself together and know that you are valued and know that you are appreciated. The most powerful words that you can ever say are the words that you say about yourself to yourself while you're by yourself. That's right. So you got to believe in yourself. Even if you have to do it by yourself, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and start your business. Go ahead and go back to school. Go ahead and 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 envision and dream and be what God is calling you to be. Opportunities, doors are opening. Territory is going to be available to you. These are great opportunities and days are coming our way. The world is marching for you. So go ahead brother go ahead sister and protest because a future is before us and i'm so glad that my tomorrow looks much better than my yesterday yes it does yes it does i once was young but now i'm old and i have never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread yes i will bless the lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. God is doing a new thing. All things have been passed away and behold, all things have become new. We have to get ready for the new day, the new day. Some of us are harboring bitterness and frustration and anger in our spirit. But God is saying you got to release that. And be ushered into the new place that God is taking you. You have to release that. You have to release where God is, is taking you right now and, and enjoy the fruit of your future. Enjoy that new place where God is taking you. And be and be encouraged in that. And be encouraged in that. God bless you. That was my publisher calling right now. I'll call him back. Because I'm dealing with you right now. <laughs> so, um, but, but that's where we are. So, you know, um, so then um, here, here's another question. Um, and, and I'll just deal with this. Hold on, let me get back to the screen. So uh, you had a post, Bishop, about white people, oh God, about white people attending, uh, um, uh, black people attending white churches 
Uh, do you have a problem with that? And can you bring clarity to that? Hmm. Wow. So let's talk about that. All right. First of all, let me say that I believe in multiculturalism. Um, matter of fact, when you look at who's marching for us today, um, it's all races that's marching. So I believe that that in multicultural multiculturalism, I believe in that. Our church is multicultural. We have whites here, we have blacks here, we have um, some Hispanics here. Um, so I believe in multiculturalism. What I was saying in that in that particular post was that um, that if well, first let me go back and say this. It is interesting to me that b blacks go to white churches, but very seldom do whites come to black churches. Um, we are more pr prone to sit under a white pastor, a white pastor than, um, than whites are prone to sit up under a black pastor. So that's interesting, and that's fact, okay? So I applaud those white people who do sit up under a black pastor and actually tolerate what it is that we preach, especially for those of us who preach social justice. I applaud those white um, members who come to black churches and and, and for those of us who have to preach, you know, about the political issues and injustices and, and keep it real. I preach about, um, you know, um, the injustices that's happening. I preach about what's going on in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and Black Lives Matter Avenue now. <laughs> I preach about what's going on um, that's not right, that's going on against our people. I preach about that and those people clap their hands and they shout and they dance with us and they're down with it because they have good hearts and they know what's right according to God's word. But let's take it on the other side. We have blacks that also attend white churches and some of them do for various reasons that I don't even have time to get into. But my message to them was simply this. If you're going to a white church church and you are african-american here's the thing that i think you should do now hold them to the fire on this you make sure that that white pastor and that leadership of that church is addressing this matter do not give them a pass on this all right if they value you at all and what you bring to that church you have been faithful in your stewardship. You have been faithful in your giving. You have been faithful in your participation. They owe you to discuss this. Do not let them slip on this. Secondly, tell them you need to hear a whole series and teaching on race relations from a biblical perspective. What that means. Thirdly, you want to see more inclusion in that church beyond praise teams and an occasional uh, inviting you to read scripture and praying on a Sunday morning. You want to be in the boardroom where decisions are made about the structure and the operation of that ministry. So that's what I was saying. What I was saying is perhaps you are there to hold that ministry accountable as it pertains to race relations. So if you're going to be there, because there is a blending of races in America. Just in George Floyd's murder, you saw the blending of America. You saw a white officer. You saw a Hispanic officer. You saw um, an Asian officer. Um, it looks like the guy who owned the store. I don't know exactly what he was, but he looked to be Arab. All right, uh, or of some um, Indian descent. Uh, I, I don't want. Please, please excuse me. I don't want to be um, racially 
um, uh, wrong about that, but, but he looked to be from an Eastern culture, should I say, okay? So, so, I mean, think about this. And then George Floyd, who dated a white woman, all right, she spoke out uh, from the first day of his murder. And then now the march is blend. Man, you had all this, all this multiculturalism. So then, even after the virus, we got to start talking about how are we going to diversify our churches, black and white. All right? I'm presently meeting with some white pastors now to talk about social justice and how we engage that, um, how we talk about that, the dialogue of that. We got to talk about diversity, right? So that's a real thing, but I think we also have to hold each other accountable in that regard. And do not let the white church get away without talking about race in this regard. Does that help you? All right. So then, um, listen, we're going to close out. Um, so then we have one more question here. And uh, what do you think about the president holding up the Bible in front of the church? All right. As a prop. Okay, here we go. So uh, it's a great question, and we're closing out. Matthew 12, 31 um, says that uh, it is a sin uh, to blaspheme. It's one sin to blaspheme against the people, and that you can be forgiven for that. But you cannot be forgiven for blaspheme against God. That's what Matthew 12, 31 says. This president, um, uh, if you notice that even his supporters um, have turned their back on him on this issue. Um, and um, this president, it never ceases to amaze me what extent he will go to to get attention. Narcissism is a very serious disease and I'm convinced that he is consumed with that um, and so he goes to the extent of getting this attention and he uses the Bible and the church as a prop which is very bad um, the real issue here is that he was holding the Bible upside down um, and that's been his problem the whole time. When you hold the Bible upside down, you can't read it right. That's been his problem. He has never read the Bible right. If he had read the Bible right, he wouldn't have ever felt comfortable snatching babies out of mother's hands and putting them in cages. If he had ever read the Bible right, he wouldn't have ever felt comfortable dehumanizing disabled people and picking on how they move their arms and move their hands. If he read the Bible right, he wouldn't have ever called white supremacists and Nazis good people, really. If he had ever read the Bible right, if he'd ever read the Bible right, he would not have ever, he would not have ever bragged about groping a woman in her, in her private area. If he'd have read the Bible right, he wouldn't have said some of the mean things that he said, not just over the course of these four years, but even prior to that, if he'd have read the Bible right. If he'd have read the Bible right, he wouldn't have ever urged his supporters to start riots and body slam people and drag them out. The problem with this president, it's not so political for me about parties because every party has its own issue. But the problem with this president is that his heart is so far from the compassion of God. And, and the church has made an error. The white evangelical church has made an error in lining up itself with that heart. And now we're paying a heavy price. 
We're paying a heavy price. The nation is paying a heavy price. And so then, him standing in front of the church, that's not who he is. If you noted that the church was boarded up, and it was almost as if God was saying, you ain't coming in here, because <laughs> your heart is so far away from my heart. You're not coming in here. And I just want to urge you, don't use the church. Don't use God's word as a prop. But live by his word and study his word and trust his word. And when we're able to come back in the church, be like the psalmist when he said, I was glad when he said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord where our feet shall dwell within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Listen, beloved, I'm so glad that you have decided to join me today. And I hope these, um, these questions have brought some clarity to you about where I am in my spirit and in my heart. Please don't forget to make a donation uh, to our ministry and uh, be of support to us. And uh, don't forget, go out there and order your copy of Who Stole Sunday Morning. It'll be a blessing to your life. And uh, SirWalterMack.com, you can order this book. It'll be a blessing to your life. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you, and we'll see you again. Hello. First of all, we want to thank you so much for your generous support so that we can continue to operate in excellence. The following are ways to give tithes and offerings using technology. Use the Push Pay app or go to Giving Page on the Union Baptist website. Use the Cash app which is dollar sign, capital U-B-C, trade, 1200. Use the Givelify app, Union Baptist Church, Winston-Salem. For Rise Up Giving, please use the designated cash app, dollar sign, Union Baptist, Rise Up. If you don't use technology for giving, you may bring your tithes, offering, and Rise Up campaign payments on Sundays from 10 a.m. till noon. Envelopes will be available, or you can mail checks only. No cash, only checks to 1200 North Trade Street, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, 27101. Now please make a note of the following announcements. Thursdays at 6.30 p.m., it's Breaking Bread with Bishop. Get the family together and have family dinner while watching Bible study. If this is not a convenient time, you can view the video 24 hours a day on our Facebook page, website, or YouTube. Saturday morning worship schedule, 9 a.m. phone line worship, 10 a.m. C2C remix phone line worship, 11 a.m. Saturday connect worship by Zoom. On Saturday evening, we will have our phone line church conference call at 7 p.m. Our Sunday morning worship schedule, 8.30 a.m. phone line worship, 9 a.m. Sunday school, 10 a.m. virtual worship. Go to the Union Baptist website, YouTube, or Facebook. 12 p.m. service will be broadcast on the Truth Radio Station, 1340 a.m. Please note the new number for our phone line. Dial 774-258-4711. No code needed. Dial straight in. Please continue to visit the Union Baptist website updates page. Click on the Members button. And remember, wash your hands frequently. Avoid large crowds over the size of 10. Cover coughs and sneezes. Stay at home when you're sick. Don't hoard food. The supply chain is fine right now. Have a blessed week. Thank you.